the murmurings, okay? And, 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 they, uh, and they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear you not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. And the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all the, horse, all the host, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have got me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen, and the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. There was a cloud of darkness to them, but it gave light by night to there to these, so that one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall on their, on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it passed in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and under cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels. Now, now let me, may I say this to you? If I was driving a chariot in this situation and the wheels fell off, I'm getting out of there. I'm leaving. I, I'm not going, forget the Israelites. I'm, there's, there's more going on here. But apparently most mm, didn't pay any attention that they drank them heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee. Oh, there we go. Now we're at least got the good idea. Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. The Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength. When the morning appeared, the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned, covered the chariots and the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, there remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day on the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. Israel saw that great work which the Lord did unto the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your blessings, and thank you for all that you've given, all that you've done for us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll just deal with hearts tonight. I pray, God, that you'll encourage those who are saved, and Lord God, cause those who are lost to realize their condition. I thank you for all the blessings you've given. I thank you for the camp. I thank you for those who have faithfully come out and worked here. I pray now, Heavenly Father, you'll take the message and touch each heart. Walk among us. Deal with us. And I ask you, Lord God, that you'll fill me and use me tonight. And I'll say the words that you once said. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last night, of course, we dealt with the issue of the detour, that God took them in a direction that was not the way that you would think to go. Uh, you, you need to understand something about God. He's not interested in the way you think things should go. He's interested in you going the way he says to go. Amen. And I'll say over and over again, if you're going to have God's guidance, you've got to have God governing you. That is right. just the way it is. He has to govern your life which means he has to be in control. And he doesn't go like you think he should go. And oftentimes when God does things, we wonder and we question. We'll even go to the saying, 
I don't understand what God is doing here. It is not like we know the reasoning behind it. But God has a reason. He has a knowledge. As we read in chapter number 13, we saw that God didn't take them the short way simply because they weren't ready for war. There was something they needed yet. There were so many things in their lives. You know, I, I remember a preacher saying a long time ago that uh, a new convert is not ready. He's not ready to bear burdens or he's not ready to fight battles. Mm -hmm. He has to be prepared. You have to be grounded. It is important. It, it is an amazing, listen folks, it is an amazing thing what God has started and developed and brought into existence this thing called the New Testament church that he has brought together as, as a direct result of his actions. He started it. He brought it into existence. He set it up the way it's supposed to be. It's a fantastic design. When you stop and consider that a, a, a somebody who has just gotten saved, who doesn't know anything, can come into this thing called the church and be taught and trained and prepared for the things in their life. That's the whole that's the whole idea behind it. It is, it is such, from a very physical level, it, it is such a tremendous design by God. Man tries to do things like this and there are utter disasters. Yeah. But when God does it, it's almost 2,000 years that the New Testament church and its design has been in existence and it's still doing the job, preparing hearts and preparing people for the work that God has for them. In the wilderness, the children of Israel had to learn some things. They mentioned this, and this is a brief review. I want you to see that they will learn the command of God. They're going to have to learn his word. Mm -hmm. Amen. They will learn the counsel of God. They're going to have to learn his work. Boy, can I spend a lot of time on this. You've got to get into the word of God. And you've got to understand what God considers a work. I was invited to... Uh, this thing years ago, oh my goodness, it's probably been 25 years ago, this guy had a Christian coffee shop. That's interesting. So he invited me to it. And I'm always curious about goofy things. Uh, you know, it seems to follow with my nature. And, uh, you know, uh, my pastor said that you would get a church like you. And, uh, Brother Chip, you understand this probably better Amen. than anybody. Uh, I, I, had, I had a bunch of crazy people who would do weird things like stand on chairs in the choir and, you know, things like that. <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't make mention of who would do that, but anyway. Hey, when you're four foot eleven, you got to go with what you got, amen? And, amen. And uh, uh, so uh, the, these things, and, and he invited me to this, to this uh, coffee tea shop or whatever, and invited some of the other pastors. So I went, I was curious. And I was sitting, and I listened to him talk, and he wanted to have a big team rally down at the five flags, and they're going to bring this preacher in, who I was not, you know, I'm not going to be part of this at all. And so he's trying to raise some money to do this, and uh, uh, I'm just sitting there listening, and, and he's struggling with trying to get people to give money to this thing, and I'm, I'm not giving a penny to it. I'm not, I'm not no part of this thing. And uh, so he comes to me and, and he kind of points me out in the group. He said, Brother Harper, what do you think? Now, that was his mistake. It was not my mistake. That was his mistake. I says, I won't be a part of this. I said, because it needs to come out of the New Testament church. And I, I know I've heard of this guy and he's not local church and he's not King James. Oh, Brother Harper, you just always. Say, yes, I'm always that way. I said, let me tell you something else. If I decided to do this. We would pay for it, and I would need your help. And I left. Amen. I'm not interested in the plot. They, they, they come up with all these, and they never, oh, by the way, they never did have this thing. And uh, they come up with all these worldly ideas and all these principles. We're going to do this, and we're going to have this, and we're going to have the other thing. Huh. Listen. If it's not under the authority of a local Testament church, it's not under it's not under God's authority. Right. It's not under His control. Yeah. Come on, Amen. man. Let's, let's just be straight. If, if this is if it's not there, if it's not under His New Testament church, and He's not running it, then it does. It's not of God, Amen. and it's going to fall apart. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. That's my hobby horse. I I, I rode that and killed it. Move on. 
So again, you need to learn the, the, the work of God. We saw that. You need to learn to commune with God. You need to learn to worship. I think one of the things that's missing amongst our people today is how to worship God. We, 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 we've got so many extremes that it doesn't make any sense. There's just no worship or praise. We go from, we go from all the, 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 the one crowd that says you got to hoot and holler and carry on. And I'm not against uh, amens and I'm not against shouting at church. I don't have a problem with that. And, and then you got the other crowd that's got a uh, you know, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And you get these extremes. And, and there's not a real heartfelt worship. It becomes a method. It becomes uh, an activity. It becomes it becomes not of God. But it, it has nothing to do with God. So they, had to, they had to learn to worship. Not only that, they had to learn to God's course, walking His way. There's a lot of people who think I can go the way I want to go and what I think and what my opinion is. But you can't do that and serve God. Wow. You have to walk his way. Yep. And so this is this is the situation. This is the issue. That's why the wilderness is there. But God has now led them. He said, no, no, you're not going to go that way. You're not going to go towards the Philistines. You're not ready for war. There's some things I need to put in you. So he is taking them. But also, if you look at this, and I'm going to get ahead of myself. God's going to do two things at once. I can only handle one thing at a time. I'm, I'm very single-minded. I can't, I can't multitask. You know, it, it doesn't happen. I can't do it. God can multitask. He can do that. He is taking Israel and taking them into the wilderness. And at the same time, he's going to deal with Egypt. He says that. I'll get into that in just a minute. I want you to look at it, but I want you to notice something. I want you to notice a verse. I want you to go with me to Psalm 66. Psalm 66. In, in Psalm 66, verses number five and verse number six. Listen what God, listen to what the psalmist says, okay? He says, come and see the works of God. He is terrible in his doing toward the children of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the, the flood on foot. They did, there did we rejoice in him. You notice that little phrase, come and see. You know, the psalmist is saying to the children of Israel, I want you to come and see what God did. I want you to look at it. I want you to consider it. I want you to understand what God did and realize who God is and, and, and his workings. And now, now remember, the psalmist, this writing is, is approximately five, six hundred years later. And he's telling the children of Israel, come and see, come, come, come and look at this again. Come and look at what God has done back here. I want you to see the issue. And you know what? Some now, now some three, four thousand years later, we have the opportunity to come and see all over again what God has done. And it's so interesting to look at this because if you go back to Exodus chapter 14, and this is where we'll be the rest of the night. If you go back to Exodus chapter 14, you'll realize that God put them in a very difficult situation. He brought them to a dead end. There are some times in our lives that you would think that God has brought you to a dead end. That there is no way out. And you have no direction. And circumstance completely surround you. And you have nowhere you can go. You are bottled up, as the old saying would be. That's where Israel is. At the Red Sea. So let me show you a few things here. I want to show you a couple of things. And I want to give it to you tonight. Let you consider it. And take the application as it would be. The first thing I want you to see in chapter number 14 as you watch this. And God is, is directing this. God says, i got to fight with this Pharaoh. God will defend his glory. And fight for his people. I have warned people over and over again. That you need to understand, you do something to me, 
I don't need to retaliate. I got somebody bigger and more powerful that will deal with you. That's right. Years ago, well, back in, oh, I think it was 81, may have been 82, uh, we were renting a, a, the top of a house just outside of Dubuque. And it was, it was a nice place, and, and we had agreed verbally with the landlord that the rent would never go up more than $10 a year. So each year we were paying $225, so the next year we should be paying $235. That was our handshake agreement. Nothing in writing, okay? Yeah, I know better than that, okay, now. So anyway, we got to the end of the year, and we would, and also part of this agreement was that we would give them a 30-day notice of our moving before we move. So on July the 1st, they came to us, we moved in on the 1st of August, and they said, we're raising the price $50 more than what you're paying now. We couldn't afford it. I mean, it's, 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 honestly, we just couldn't afford it. And I told them, I said, wait a minute, we had an agreement. And you know what they said? You don't have it in writing. Yeah. Lack of character on their part. Upset, very upset. And my wife and I talked about it. So on the 3rd of July, we told them we're moving out the 1st of August. Well, we didn't give them a 30 day notice. So they kept our deposit. But not only that, we, we were on fuel oil for the heating. We had filled the fuel oil tank. We paid our half of the fuel oil tank at the end of winter. So now we have the fuel oil, we have the loss of our, and now we gotta find a place to live. Well, we found a place to live and we moved out. We had forgotten a box or two at the place. And I drove over there on the 2nd of August, 2nd or 3rd of August to get that box that we had left in, our, in that uh, upstairs place. Guess what? Their son and daughter had already moved in. They had told us that they didn't have anybody to live there. What had happened, and we found this out later, is their son had gotten laid off, and so they wanted a place for him to live, so they had to get rid of us. Right, we were upset. I told my wife, I said, just leave it in the hands of God. Let God take care of this. Okay, just leave it in the hands of God. It's a beautiful house, and the, the, the upstairs of it was three bedrooms. Our front room was, I think, like 25 feet by 15 feet and big bay windows. This beautiful up part of the up, the top side of the house was gorgeous, and it looked overlooked the whole city of Dubuque. Excellent place. And so I said, just leave it. Let God deal with it. Uh, I'm not going to get bitter. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to do anything about it. I saw the uh, man... A year later, his name was Davis, Mr. Davis, and, and he couldn't even look at me because he knew he cheated me. About two or three years later, we were driving out to one of the members who were going past the road where the house was. And my son made the statement. He said, oh, Dad, did you hear a plane hit that house? I said, Robert, don't be telling stories. And we went out by one of our the, the members, and I mentioned to him, I said, Robert said, a plane hit the house. We went, oh, yeah, preacher, I forgot to tell you about it. It was really foggy, and there was a tower next to the house, and a, a, a small two-engine plane hit the tower and landed on the top of the house and took the whole top of the house out. And, and then went on to find out that the... The, the, the county would not let them rebuild the top of the house into an apartment. They had to just put a roof on it, and they had to build their son a house next door. Now, let me tell you what I learned about this. This cost them a whole lot more than if they'd have just paid us what they really owed us. You see, you let God take care of a thing, and he does it a whole lot better than you do. Amen. But on the other side, he also protected us knowing what was coming with a plane because nobody was hurt on their family. They were, they, 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 the people were gone, but we would have been home when the plane landed on the top of the house. 
So he worked on both sides. He fought for us and he protected us at the same time. You see, that's how God is. He can handle those particular things if we would just let him, if we would let him take care of God is willing to fight for you. Well, now, let me tell you something else involved with this particular point. If you want to see, no, notice what happened. Notice the beginning of chapter number 14. <clears throat> chapter number 14, I want you to see something. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, you know who he told what he was going to do? Yes, he told Moses. You know why he told Moses? Because Moses is the man of God leading the children of Israel. Amen? He says, yes. Moses, this is what I'm going to do. Amen. I am going to take care of this, and this is, I am leading you to a place, and don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of things because I want to finish it with Pharaoh and the Egyptians for what they've done to my people for 400 years. Now let me say this to you, folks. Can I give you something? God gives insight to the pastor that you don't have. Amen. You'd be surprised. I had the opportunity to pastor for 34 years. Pastor the same church for 34 years. There were times that I saw things coming in the lives of people that they didn't see. And I tried to tell them and they wouldn't listen because you know what? What do I know? Amen? Yeah. What do I know? Brother Kuzel mentioned it this morning, talking about how the pastor said, don't marry this girl. Don't go this way. Amen. There are things that the pastor sees. There are things that, that God shows him that he doesn't show other people. He may not even show you about some directions and things like that. I have, I, I, listen, folks, for 34 years, and I cannot explain it. I cannot tell you why. I cannot tell you how. It's not that I'm more of a spiritual individual, but God directs his man and gives him insight. One of the more amazing things to me is the direction that God had given to the church and the insight that he had given to me involved with this. And when I resigned, that was gone. I didn't understand that. I thought that that was natural part of the spiritual growth. But it's not. It's for the pastor. When he pastors, he has to have a vision. And that vision includes the membership. And he will tell you, tell the pastor things that he doesn't tell the congregation. And he will give them. And, and it's not a lording over the people. It's not you've got to obey everything the preacher said. And I'll point something out about that in a minute. And, and, and all that kind of stuff. He, he's not perfect. He, he, he's, he's just a man like everybody else. But I'm telling you that vision is given to him. And you need to pay attention to it. Amen. God told Moses, he said, hey. I'm going to deal with Pharaoh. Don't you be worried about where I'm taking the children of Israel. Now the children of Israel are worried about it. Which brings me to my second point. I want you to see the faithlessness of the people. And, and, and it doesn't take long, does it? Boy, oh boy, here's what happens. They start crying. Uh, you brought us out here to die. You know, I think that was their mantra through most of the wilderness. Amen? Yeah. You brought us out here to die. You brought us out here to die. And when they disobeyed God, they finally died in the wilderness. They got what they, they complained about. All those years, they complained about. The, the, you brought us out here to die in the wilderness. Then they rejected God's plan. And guess what? They died in the wilderness. Yep, that's right. Amen. You got what you asked for. You brought us out here murmuring, complaining. Oh, oh. <laughs> I didn't write the verses down, but I was reading this, this uh, morning. And I was looking at it. And... It's interesting when you look at uh, the children of Israel in the wilderness, and it's in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. You look at it, he talks about how they committed adultery, they committed fornication, how they practiced idolatry, and then you know what he included with it? Murmuring. Mm -hmm. He included murmuring with adultery. Well, You'd be a good Catholic. You know that that's a venial sin, not a major sin. Come on. 
<laughs> Murmuring is venial. You say, what in the world? See, in the Catholic religion, you've got major sins and venial sins. You've got the, the, these are the bad ones, and these are the minor ones down here. But with God, that murmuring was as bad as adultery and fornication. Are you a complainer? Think about it. I don't know why we're doing this. I don't know why we're doing that. You know, I had a man in the church when I pastored. I pastored him for over 25 years. If I said the sky was blue, blue he would say, no, it's not. It's black. <laughs> no matter what. And his first name was Bob, too. I mean, it was, it was terrible. But he was always complaining and murmuring. It was a thorn in my side. We, we had to, to do a very, very difficult thing because of some sin that had taken place in the life of my son who refused to repent, we had to remove him from the church membership. We had to put him under church discipline. And in the business meeting, this Bob said, Preacher, you don't know how hard this is. I say, what? I'm churching my own son. I don't know how hard this is? Are you kidding me? My wife almost fell over in a dead faint. She said, yeah. So but here's what happened, okay? We got down to the end where I had I had resigned on Wednesday night and asked the church to keep me as its uh, um, interim pastor until we found a pastor. And they voted to do that. Now, when I resigned, there were some people weeping and there were some people in the parking lot uh, rejoicing and dancing and everything else. They thought that was a great thing. Well, that Sunday afterwards, I was thinking about it and praying about it all week long. And I thought about that Bob. And I thought to myself, I'm not leaving him for the next guy. I don't want the next guy coming in thinking, boy, you didn't do anything with this fellow. I want him gone. I want him out of there. So after Sunday morning church, you say, you're like that? Yes, I'm like that. Some people, I'm going to tell you something. After, after being around me for a while, after hearing me preach, you will rejoice over the pastor God gave you. I generally help the pastor that God has given to that church by thinking at least we didn't get him. And uh, so uh, after services on Sunday morning, I called that Bob up there. I said, Bob, I said, for all these years you've been in this church, you have been nothing but trouble, nothing but a problem, complaining, difficult, all the time. And I says, enough is enough. You need to leave. And he, he said, you said that. Yes, I did. I said that. Hey, I believe the old adage, some people bless you by their coming, and some people bless you by their going. That's yeah. right. Bob said, this is my church. If I want to stay here, I ought to stay here. I said, all right, you go ahead. I'm going to pray about this thing. As far as I'm concerned, if you ain't going to leave, God might as well kill you. I don't want to leave him for the next guy. The next Sunday, Church services end of Sunday. He comes up to me. He says, I want to tell you something. I remember now, I have resigned as the pastor. I want to tell you something. I just can't follow your leadership anymore. Okay. And I'm not going to stay here. I'm leaving. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> and God said, shut up. I said, fine. He left. Amen. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Listen to me. All that murmuring and complaining, you better be careful. God will judge. He views that very harshly. This is the faithlessness of these people. May I say to you, their faith is, st is stymied. You know why their faith is stymied? Because of an acceptance of natural conditions. Amen? They come up and they are surrounded in a peninsula they got mountains, they got water. Naturally speaking, there is no way out. And because of it, their faith is in. They looked at the natural and said, nothing can be done. When your faith is put to the test, you are brought to a place when the natural appears one way and God 
will do something a completely different way. When you get to that place and you say, there's just nothing we can do about it. There's, there's nothing can be done. It's, it, all this is a disaster. This is all a failure. Everything's going to happen. We don't stand a chance. And God says, you're just looking at what's there. And you're not looking at me. I can do something about this. That's why they were faithless. Remember, I told you they went out in harvest that's in rank. Well, okay, you, you're ready. They, they go out thinking they're soldiers and they're going to fight a battle. And now the battle showed up. And guess what? They're ready to surrender and go home. Mm -hmm. They weren't ready to fight. God knew that. God knew that all along. See, God knows when you're ready to handle a thing. God knows when you're ready. And he has established a situation simply because he wants to accomplish an end. Do you understand in your life, God wants to accomplish an end. He has a purpose. He sees tomorrow. He knows what's coming. He knows your circumstances. He understands what needs to be done. And if you need a miracle, he can do that. Amen. The impossible is not impossible with God. Amen. Listen. Circumstances will often reveal your true condition. Amen? Amen. Now we see whether you got faith or not. Things go bad. What do you do? You murmur. I wrote this down. I, I read it somewhere. When you get in these situations, when you come to a dead end, don't fear, don't fuss, don't flee, and don't fall apart. Because if God is leading you, he has brought you to a dead end that he may do something it's miraculous. You know what? You know what? I, you know what this generation needs to see? They need to see the miracles of God. I was studying something, and I'm studying the life of Elijah, Elijah and Elisha. And I've been reading about something, and a man made a statement to me that was interesting. He said, "Did you notice during the times of David and the times of Solomon, which is the peak of Israel's spirituality?" It is the peak of when they were, that's the, I guess you would call it their golden age, that there are no miracles done. I never paid attention to that. The times of David, there are no miracles done. I mean, you know, David defeated Goliath. And that's about the only thing. But as far, there's no miracles done. But in Israel's awfulest time, when Ahab's the king, You've got Elijah, and we have recorded eight miracles by him, and Elisha, and we've got 16 miracles by him. So when the, the spiritual is more dark, there are more miracles. Then I come to the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the fullness of time, what do we got? We've got the Romans who are idolaters, and we've got the nation of Israel who it is nothing but law in practice. You have no real worship of God, no real looking for God. And guess what? The Lord Jesus comes along and does miracles. I've got me thinking. I'm dangerous when I'm thinking. You know what this is? This is a dark time. Very dark time. In our society here in America, there is not a belief in God. It's about God. I study history. One of the things that I discovered in studying history that back in 1797, one out of every 53 people was a Baptist. One out of every 53. By the 1850s, it was one out of about every 17. By 1960, it was one out of every eight. One out of every eight people in the United States was a Baptist. That's 12.5% of the population of the United States was Baptist. 
That's a controlling group. It's huge. And we ended up with a Catholic president. I don't know how that happens. Today, I don't know what the numbers are, but I guarantee you they're not one in eight. I think we're back to more like one in 50 or 60 or 70 or 100. I'm telling you that we're living in one of the darkest times in the United States since its inception. And you know what that means? We are primed for miracles because God still wants to reveal that he is God. That's, that's, see, this is all about the glory of God. Oh, well, what's going to happen to the Egyptians is all about the glory and honor of God. The children of Israel going into the wilderness is all about the honor and glory of God. God has given a promise to Abraham. He's going to keep that. In fact, when, when God gets fed up with the children of Israel and wants to kill them all, guess what Moses does? He reminds him of that. He says, what's the world going to say about you? That you could bring him out, but you can't bring him in? Amen. He reminds him. He, he, Moses doesn't say, well, these people deserve a second chance. No, no. He, he doesn't worry about the people's chance. He deals with God's honor. And God's glory. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. This country is supposedly founded on the things of God. Our Constitution is written around the Word of God. What's happening here realistically falls to the honor of God. You know what I'm looking for? I'm looking for some miracles. Yeah. Because He's God. I'm looking for Him to do some great things. Why? Because He's God. His honor is at stake here. Why? makes this such an exciting time. Look around and, oh, I'm afraid of this and I'm afraid of that. Yeah. Think about Elijah. He's got Ahab and Jezebel. Look at Elisha. He's got Ahab and then he's got Ahab's son. These people are awful. Ungodly. And yet look at what God does. Both on a nationwide schedule and on a personal schedule. He is God. He is to be honored. Well, listen to me, my friend. I'm going to tell you something. Our faithlessness has caused us a huge amount of problems. Huge amount of problems. And it's caused us some, so much difficulty. I, 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 we are a people that have just, we've made a mess out of faith. The idea of faith, I, I, I feel for this generation coming up because my generation of Christianity has been all about things, methods, practices, and not about faith in God. Yeah. And they don't have anything to look to. And that that's just wrong. It's just listen, I'm gonna tell you something. He's still God. Amen. He can do things. This this, this belief that, that well, you know, men is wax worse and worse, and God can't do anything. Have you read the book of Revelation? You understand what he's going to do in the tribulation when it hasn't come yet. My friends, I'm going to tell you something. He's God. He can do it. Mm -hmm. he, he, he's the God of miracles. He's the God of, uh, he's the God of might. And his honor is at stake. And it is at this particular time. He can do some great things. But I want you to notice something else here. I want you to see what happens. And, and this actually is, uh, Moses made a mistake. He, he screwed up. Yep, he did. Watch, watch this. Look at verse number 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear you not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Moses said to the people, and I want you, hey, 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 God's going to take care of it. Now that's great. That's great. And he told them to stand still. Okay? And I've heard preaching on this, on this verse. Yeah, stand still and see God's salvation. And I've heard a lot of preaching about it. But I want you to see what, when Moses goes to God, look at what, in verse number 15. And the Lord said unto the Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me? What, what, are, what are you doing? What are you doing here? Why are you coming to me? You say, what? Watch what God says. Because it's important. Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Remember what God said? He gave them the cloud to lead them, right? When they came to the Red Sea, where was the cloud?